Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where we bring evidence, experience, and perspective to make sense of today's leading health challenges. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. This is Lindsay Smith-Rogers. The headlines are filled with what sound like accelerations of climate change, massive deadly wildfires, bleached coral reefs, extreme heat, ocean temperatures over 100 degrees. Are we reaching a tipping point from which there's no return? Stephanie Desmond talks to Ben Zeitchik, a planetary scientist at Johns Hopkins, about what we can do now to mitigate and plan for certain climate thresholds that appear to be fast approaching. They also discuss whether climate change is truly an existential crisis or if it's something else. Let's listen. Ben Zeitchik, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. So there's a lot of climate news that we're hearing these days, from the fires in Maui to the Antarctic sea ice melting. Talk to me about sort of the current situation and what you see in the near future. Yeah, so the current situation, uh, unfortunately, is consistent with what we expect to see, right? As the planet warms, it's not just about temperature ramping up slowly on the average. It's about seeing regional extremes increase and seeing how the projection of a global signal of climate change ends up changing the weather, um, ecosystem response, and other dynamics in the place where you live. So we're seeing a lot of that. Now, in this particular year, uh, as far as we can assess at this point, the vast majority of the probability and the severity of the events that we're seeing uh, are about this trend, this climate trend, interacting with other kinds of change. And so for anyone who's followed the news in Hawaii, certainly we know there's been ecological change, land use change, other factors at play. There are talk, of course, about the year 2023 having other drivers. So people who've been reading about climate extremes are maybe familiar with El Nino. We are in an emerging El Nino year, and that is having an appreciable contribution to some of the events we're seeing. Uh, But it's still secondary to the trend we expect in most cases um, related to climate change. For some regions, the El Nino ends up being more important. Overall, the sum picture of what we're seeing is really a climate change picture. And then there are other factors people note. I mean, there was a large volcanic eruption. People might remember that has contributed to some changes in the atmospheric chemistry. Um, but those kinds of factors are small compared to the climate change going on and the El Nino event. And these feel very extreme. Um, you know, we've all heard about Arizona with, you know, 110 plus days for a month. Um, what is it we can do now to sort of um, mitigate those uh, events for humans? Yeah. And so there's a tremendous amount that we can do. Right. And so in the climate world, of course, we're very concerned with the idea of reducing greenhouse gas emissions in order to uh, minimize future change. At the same time, we're also quite focused on adaptation. And adaptation can mean a lot of different things. We're trying to build a resilience to the extremes we're seeing now and to the changes in frequency and intensity of those extremes as we move forward. And so in a case like extreme heat, we have many tools at our disposal. Uh, Obviously, there's the potential to make sure that vulnerable groups uh, are warned in advance, that they have access to cool spaces, that we're addressing issues like energy poverty, or infrastructure, um, all the factors that lead to some people not being able to access cooling relief during an extreme heat event. We can also talk about how we build our cities, for example, better. How do we make sure that cities are less prone to these extremes? Because right now we have this urban heat island phenomenon that makes cities harder than the surrounding. If you can counteract the urban heat island phenomenon, if you can do that by reducing uh, the percentage of the area covered in pavement, if you can use brighter building materials, if you can green environments, increase infiltration of water that can evaporate and cool a city, uh, you can really offset quite a bit. And right now, if you think about the urban heat island being on the order of up to 10 degrees Fahrenheit or more in some places and sometimes, well, if you can start to push back on that, that does quite a bit of good as you see a global warming signal pushing up at you know sometimes a smaller uh, 
order of magnitude than what you see from the urban heat island alone. So it's really an exciting time, I think, for urban planning, um, for energy systems, uh, for really improving uh, resilience and equity relative to what we currently live with, with or without climate change. So let's talk also about sort of some even bigger elements, right? So I know that there's been some talk about sort of tipping points in climate change. And I'm wondering if I could talk to me a little about that, because I also feel like what we're seeing today is we're seeing, you know, the, the ocean's boiling and it's very hot in Alaska and things like that. And so you just sort of wonder, is this all rolling very quickly downhill? Yeah. And so there certainly is, um, not only consistent change, but uh, but what we're seeing is accelerating change in a lot of places. And so accelerating change because, you know, simply the impacts of this compounding forcing that we've put on the system with our greenhouse gas emissions. And as we're seeing some feedbacks kicking in, right, when the land surface, when ecosystems start responding in a way that ends up reinforcing the extremes, right? So in that world, we're talking about continued, perhaps accelerating climate change. We're talking about ecological thresholds, Right, where maybe sometimes things will start burning more frequently, so you get a change in what kinds of plants you have, things like that. And then related to that is this question of tipping points. And so a tipping point is a little bit different in scientific terms because a tipping point is where you really see a nonlinear break, where different processes end up taking over. Um, sometimes it means that you flipped a switch where it becomes hard to come back. That's a phenomenon in research called hysteresis, right? Where if something changes, it's not like you can say, oh, let me just push it back and it'll come back. But if, for example, the Greenland ice sheet begins to melt below a certain elevation, well, then it can't come back because temperatures are warmer at low elevation than high elevation, right? So even if you return back to your initial greenhouse gas concentrations, you might not get Greenland back, right? So these are the kinds of tipping points we talk about. And in that world of tipping points, we face deep uncertainty. So you've probably heard about the recent discussion about a paper suggesting that the Atlantic uh, overturning circulation, right, the kind of conveyor belt of the ocean, the big, big circulation to drive um, transfer of energy um, across the planet through the oceans might be slowing down, might shut down faster than we might have originally expected. That could lead to large regional climate changes. If that happens, then we all of a sudden have a, a bigger challenge to contend with, right? Um, and right now, I'd say we're in this world of deep uncertainty where we don't know the timing and probability of that. If it happens, we're going to have to act uh, with a lot more coordination, a lot more purpose uh, to ensure that we can adapt to those changes. Uh, but they are changes um, that one can continue to work with, can anticipate as much as you can, can define what you want to accomplish and what failure scenarios are unacceptable and then work together uh, to meet those challenges. Even though they're in the future, some of these things are just 20, 30 years in the future, the scientist's estimate. How do we prepare now for something that's going to happen then, maybe? This is the, the trillion dollar question, right? It's a, it, it is difficult for us psychologically. It is difficult for us institutionally, right? And socially in general to invest in the future, right? We all have our own personal discount rates and really they're quite high, right? And when you think about it, like how much you, more you care about the present than the future when the future is uncertain. And we don't have good structure in place for this. And so there are a lot of different ways we can think about how to bridge that time scale um, and engage in decision process. The first thing, of course, is to take it seriously, right? And to create the structures in you know, governance in corporate world is already doing a, a good deal of, of this. Certainly insurance companies are way ahead of this, but start to create the thinking to bring people together, to discuss options. The next thing that I think is really important is to have the right people at that table and to view this as the multi-criteria problem it is. So if something's gonna happen, if, if something big is going to change and sea level is going to start rising fast because there was faster melt than we anticipated, or we're gonna end up um, having fires that make certain places non-viable or, or too high risk uh, to live in, what, are we, what, do we want, what do we hope to save, right? In what cases could you say, oh, well, my objectives can actually be met by relocation, or my objectives can be made by changing the way a resource is used. Um, and when I say my objectives, those objectives have to account for all the players involved, including those voices that typically are ignored. And so in this case of Hawaii, right, there's, of course, a, real, a concern that the city burned down. Will that city be rebuilt? That's one question, right? Probably. But who gets to rebuild and what at what cost? And then do you end up excluding people who used to live there because high price developers come in? 
Um, so those, are, you know, we have to think about these problems in advance. So we have the structure in place properly so that when such a thing happens, if it's to happen, we don't have the social change that we didn't want to happen, right? Where we have protections in place to make sure that people can rebuild. Or perhaps you can make the decision that a particular place that people live simply can't be protected with any reasonable amount of safety and investment, in which case we need to think about, okay, what are the solutions for those populations? Again, this is where we're talking about things like managed retreat, which is very difficult, relocation. Um, and, and, and doing this requires a really concerted effort. It requires, some, in some cases, some real change in the way that we think about uh, investment incentives and the way that we think about how government interacts with decision makers at various scales uh, to ensure that such planning can be done without taking on too much penalty today. So how do we get people to start? I mean, obviously people have started some of these conversations, but for example, I mean, we just I'm looking at Maui, just as the example that's in my mind um, right now, it's sort of, they didn't plan for this to happen. And so now they've got to come up with a new way to rebuild if they choose to rebuild. And then they have to come up with a way that would prevent something like this from happening again. It feels very sort of multi-level in, in every single way. It is multi-level in every single way. And so what you just said, I think, is a way that we have to think about. You could say, okay, never again. Okay, that's that's one answer. Is that an answer that we can accomplish? Well, probably we could work it through, right? What's that going to require? In so much as climate change and land use, we're interacting here, right? We have to think about, is it plausible? And is it, frankly, you know, sometimes you have to be uh, balanced in this. Is it worthwhile, right, to do everything they would take to prevent this from ever happening again, to make this a never event, right? Or is it a situation where you say, okay, well, let's figure out what the risk profile is. That decision might end up being made for people by the insurance companies, or maybe it's made by the government, right? Like, no, we cannot protect you anymore. I don't think that's the case in Maui. It's not that endangered a spot. Um, but then we say, okay, it's not a never event. We can make it a rare event, right? So what do we have? What do we have in terms of early warning systems, evacuation systems, all the things that we're relitigating right now about what was done wrong or what could have been done better there, make sure we're there in a way to do them better, right? And if we can do that, then you might be in a situation, you know what? Someday, part of that city might burn again. But we've made the decision that that's an acceptable risk to take because we are going to manage the risk to human lives properly. We are going to have the right structures in terms of the financial uh, burden that's borne by such damages, the ability to rebuild or to relocate. Um, if you have that in place, then you end up being resilient kind of in the ecological sense, you know, bouncing back um, from something that hits you. With all of the sort of bad news we've been getting this year when it comes to climate, I've heard this word often used, and I've used it myself, that we're in the middle of an existential crisis. I understand you don't feel that way. Yeah, no, I, I don't like it when people call climate change an existential crisis, and people could maybe accuse me of being too optimistic, right? But I, existential crisis, like that, that means something, right? That's a big deal. Climate change is only an existential crisis if we choose to make it one. We can adapt. We can modify our systems. We can get ahead of this. Right. I'm not going to claim that things are great, that, oh, we can actually make this just go away. Like it's there's a difference between saying something is not a problem versus being a essential crisis. Right. There's a whole middle ground there. Right? Like this is a serious problem that we have to take very seriously and work like we've never worked before right? Uh, to make it happen, uh, to make the adaptation happen the right way. But it's not as existential. It's not going to wipe us out if we work together to prevent it from doing so. And when you talk about, you know, the current extremes, the current situation we're seeing, we can definitely adapt to that. When we talk about the deep uncertainty associated with major changes, well, that's going to be a harder problem. It's still not existential, though, because if we can work collectively on this, there are areas where we can maybe minimize the suffering. And there are other areas where, quite frankly, we can uh, improve upon the situation we have today because there's such an equity and such vulnerability in our societies that we need to address. Let's address it as we adapt. Mm -hmm. So what are some things that we can do right now? There's a lot of things we can do right now. And it happens across scales. You know, from the individual perspective, right, what you can do is honestly, quite frankly, pay attention, let people know you're paying attention and send the signal. And we're seeing the signal more and more because 
climate change is hitting more and more people. And so people are paying attention there and, and we're seeing that that shift in the dialogue, right? From like, is this real? Does it matter to what do we do? And that's an incredibly important shift. You know, I, I wish it had happened 20 years ago. And now that that's happening, I think that, you know, if individuals can contribute in that way, then we can start seeing uh, a political movement and really, you know, political depends on your, on your political system. And this is a global issue. Uh, but I think that if you have a general mindset shift, a general social shift kind of across uh, the country in different countries to one where you have an action mentality and where you're recognizing that just like people love to use, you know, war analogies, right? Um, and I don't know if war analogies are the right one, but there are plenty of times where we've seen massive change happen fairly quickly in society when we mobilize. And so we need a mobilization mentality. And, you know, individuals contribute to that, but really I think we have to do it through our institutions and have a situation where planning is happening through government mechanisms, certainly, where targets are being set. Targets matter, even if you don't know how to make them yet, right? Because that throws down the gauntlet. That's also going to involve uh, enabling environments to facilitate adaptation in a way that is set in a way to favor those who are most vulnerable, to avoid major vulnerabilities. And also, there's a tremendous amount of power in the private sector on this. And so as our I already mentioned insurance companies, but certainly our investment firms, the debt managers, all of these, these uh, the property owners. How do we work together to do something as simple as say, urban adaptation requires that people living in poor and renter dominant neighborhoods can make certain improvements to their homes to make them less vulnerable. But how do you do that when the landlord's absentee? And there's a capital investment that needs to be made that pays back over time in health and in reduced energy use, but the uh, landlord doesn't see the benefit when the resident does, right? These are like seemingly simple problems that are unsolved. And so if we can get that kind of coordination across institutions, um, I think that there's a lot we can do right now. Ben Zajcik, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Public Health On Call is a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Philip Porter, Spencer Greer, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Fernandez and Shian Briscoe. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Thank you for listening.